is to think back the last time you were sick. So you might have got a viral infection, you might have contracted a cold, you might have had uh, some other sickness. And think about how you were thinking. Think about how you were feeling. How was your energy level? Were you excited about the day? Were you optimistic, interested to call up your friends and have a long conversation? Were you thinking clearly that you thought, you know, today's a good day to get my taxes ready? Chances are, unless you're a huge anomaly, you didn't want to do any of those things. You weren't feeling good at all. This has been described as sickness behavior. There's a term for it, which is when we get sick, we think and feel a different way. We actually feel a little bit more depressed. We feel a little bit more socially withdrawn. And the dominant hypothesis for why this is happening is inflammation in the brain. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button, you punch that, and it's gonna notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. That's gonna walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode, and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore why a healthy brain is key for healthy aging is Dr. Austin Perlmutter. Dr. Austin Perlmutter is a board-certified internal medicine physician, New York Times bestselling author, published researcher, and international educator. His mission is to help people improve their health by targeting the biological basis of stuckness in our brains and bodies. His writing, presentations, podcasts, and online educational programs explore how environmental factors influence our cognitive and mental state and have reached millions. Dr. Perlmutter currently serves as the managing director at Big Bold Health, a food as medicine company focused on helping people rejuvenate health through better immune function, where he is running a first of its kind study exploring the effects of plant nutrients on human aging through epigenetics. Dr. Austin, it is great to have you here today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. Me too. And and I would love to start out with how you got into focusing on the brain. Uh, I always love to get a little bit about people's stories and kind of how they got into their respective fields. Would you mind sharing just a little bit about that? For sure. So I grew up in a family where brain health was always kind of at the forefront of conversations. My dad is a neurologist. His dad was a neurosurgeon. So there was kind of an emphasis on how is your brain doing? And I, like many people, didn't want to follow immediately in the footsteps of my father. So I tried to go some other directions in my life, test out some other ideas. And I wound up in internal medicine, which is more or less chronic disease management as it relates to what internal medicine doctors or internists tend to do. So my training was all around understanding chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, some cancer management, some Alzheimer's management. And by and large, the focus was on trying to mitigate symptoms. And what I mean there is I wasn't actually reversing any disease. I, I had this idea that I was going to be preventing disease, reversing disease. And when it came to what happened in the clinic, it was prescribing drugs and trying to slow the rate of decline of people's chronic illnesses. And so in some ways that sent me back to the drawing board. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life uh, in essence, trying to manage what had already happened. I wanted to do preventive care and I wanted to help people reverse what was happening. So, you know, again, you, you kind of come into these places in your life where you realize that what was out ahead of you that you've maybe been trying to avoid or look away from is, is the right path. And in my case, it was the understanding that the brain is kind of, it, it is the driver of how we think, how we act, how we feel. And that to understand why so many people were suffering from chronic preventable diseases and why our interventions don't work for reversing or successfully mitigating those symptoms most of the time, I had to ask myself, what is it that is driving people to making the decisions they do? And the answer was the brain. So my focus for, I guess, the last five plus years has been to try to integrate my knowledge of chronic disease management with my research on how our brain state 
and how our brains connect with our gut, how our brains connect with our muscles, how our brain health connects with our immune health, how all of this can be leveraged to help people understand why they are getting stuck, why they're getting stuck in these destructive patterns of thoughts and actions, and what they can do to get this stuckness out of their brains and bodies. Because fundamental to this whole conversation was my realization that in the modern day, if you go with the flow, you will wind up sick and unhappy. That is the default outcome. And the only way to avoid that for the average person is to take back control over your mental machinery. So that makes me really passionate about what I do. And it's gotten me so excited when people tell me that the tools I've given them have allowed them to get some of that stuckness out. Most people... I don't think they necessarily understand what all our brain does for us. I think many people think that it it just helps us generate thoughts, but there's so much more to it than that. Can you tell us what all roles our brain plays in our health? Sure. And and I'd say this is far more than just most people in kind of the the general public. You know, in medical practice, the first time that a doctor would usually ask somebody about their brain health is when something goes wrong or when there's a disease that is so significant that it just can't be avoided anymore. And to that end, the, the, the huge misunderstanding we have is that brain health is only something to think about when we have a disease. And specifically, it's only something to worry about if and when we're worried about dementia. This is the scenario that develops for most people and in most clinics. No concern about brain health until there's a TBI, concern for a stroke, concern for Alzheimer's disease, or concern for a mental health issue. And this is an important point of clarification. Mental health is brain health. So meaning depression, PTSD, anxiety, stress, those are not things that exist in some sort of a mind that is external to our brains. They are a direct manifestation of our brain condition. Similarly, Alzheimer's dementia, which most people would say, okay, something's going wrong in the brain if a person can't think well, it's not just about what happens when you get the diagnosis. Uh, changes in brain function that might be foggy thinking that maybe later in life turn into dementia that's still brain health issues that are happening now. So how you think, how you act, and how you feel are all a direct manifestation of your brain health. And importantly, there are things that we can be doing to improve that brain function and structure. And it is imperative that we do not wait until we're 20, 30, 40 years down the line and something is seriously broken. And you say, you know, I can't think well, I've just been diagnosed with dementia. Or in another way of thinking about it, I can't feel well and I've been diagnosed with depression. All of these are brain states that there are things we can do today to help mitigate risk of and potentially prevent completely. So that's what the brain does. Basically, how you think, how you act, how you feel, and there are things you can do today to change that. Now, you just brought up Alzheimer's and dementia. Now, this is for our audience, especially people 50, 60, 70 plus, this is a major concern for them. Uh, maybe they themselves are concerned about it, or maybe they've seen uh, that happen with their parents too, and it's a concern for them. Can we maybe talk about why do people develop Alzheimer's and dementia? And is it something that they, they can actually do something about once they have the condition? Right. Well, you brought up this question of, or this, this thought of, you know, maybe some people are concerned about it and I don't want to fear monger here, but people should be concerned about Alzheimer's. Why do I say that? It's because a, a recent paper published in the Lancet, which is a highly regarded medical journal predicted that by the year 2050, there'll be 153 million people around the world suffering from Alzheimer's dementia. So sure that you could say, well, that's some people, but by then we'll have a cure at this time there is no pharmaceutical management for Alzheimer's that significantly improves cognition. Now I'll say that again, there's really no drug that works for this. I have the benefit of getting to work with my dad, who's really one of the experts on this topic. He has been lecturing on the subject of Alzheimer's for decades, but in both his and my case, we have a family history. His dad, who was a brilliant neurosurgeon, suffered from Alzheimer's disease. So we've seen this really close to home. And I will tell you, as somebody who has been around many people, both patients and family members with Alzheimer's, 
this is not a pleasant way to go. It's a progressive loss of the way that you can interact with your friends, your family, knowledge of what's happening around you. It isn't just some sort of a calm, you know, drop off that happens at the very end of life. Often people experience Alzheimer's for years. And I'll emphasize this point again, modern medicine has no solutions to this disease as of now. So why should that matter to us today? It's because we understand that Alzheimer's isn't something that happens overnight. You don't wake up uh, one morning and you can't think anymore. This is a process that probably develops as soon as our 20s and our 30s. There was recently somebody in that age group that actually was diagnosed with dementia, specifically Alzheimer's dementia. And just to clarify a point here, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia around the world. So there's Lewy body, there's vascular dementia, there's a number of subtypes. Alzheimer's is the most common subtype of dementia. As it relates to what we can do about it, a number of studies have shown both that there are mechanisms like inflammation, metabolism, hormones that are linked to Alzheimer's, but also that when people do a specific set of lifestyle change, or when they uh, basically bring these changes into their lives, that it correlates with a much lower chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. And we can talk about these in detail, but there are things like eating a certain type of pattern of diet. There are things like getting regular exercise. There are things like engaging in cognitive tasks that actually stimulate the brain. We often talk about exercising the body. We don't usually talk about the role of exercising the brain. It turns out also to be very important in building reserve. So there's a number of things, I guess, to make a long story a little shorter that each of us can and should be doing to help mitigate the risk that we develop Alzheimer's at all. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I wanna take one more minute to talk about if you are somebody who was newly diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, and you're at a point where you're stressed, you're worried, you're overwhelmed, you have no idea where to start or how to get started getting confident in your plan, or maybe something has been proposed as an option that you're not ready to go down yet, right? You wanna to try to do everything you possibly can naturally before considering that as an option, or, if you're the person who has been on this journey for a while, you've tried to figure all these things out on your own when it comes to osteoporosis, but you're still losing bone. If either of those situations is where you're at right now, I wanna tell you about the Stronger Bone Solution Program. Over 5,000 people have come through the Stronger Bone Solution Program, and it walks you through the exact process you need to fill in the missing pieces, uncover critical things in your plan that you may not be aware of, and help you make modifications, adjustments, and tweaks to get you to the place where you're building stronger bones. That's what this program can do for you. And it's run for years and helped many, many people. And I want you to be able to benefit from this program as well. So if you're not confident and you're waking up every single day worried about fracture, wondering how, are you, how am I going to improve my bone health today? I don't want you to be in that position. I want you to get confident in your plan so that you can focus on living life and enjoying the life that you deserve with the people you love most. So if that's where you wanna be, head over to bonecoach.com forward slash apply and apply for our Stronger Bone Solution program right now. I'm Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I wanna see you inside this program. I wanna help you get on the path to improvement in Stronger Bones. So go over, submit your application. If we approve your application and it's free to apply, then we'll let you know the next steps to get started in one of those programs. So hope to see you inside very soon. Let's get back to the episode. Well, maybe let's go down that path just a little bit even and talk about diet and exercise and what are the things that we can be doing to maybe have a favorable impact now and set us up for a better future. For sure. Well, let's start with the general idea of, of what's in your head. And I don't mean you, Kevin, I mean just everyone has kind of a, a similar set of things going on in their head. So you've got billions of neurons, right? And you've heard the word neuron before. Neurons are kind of the brain's principal cell, and they're the ones that get the majority of the attention. It's how many neurons do you have? How are those neurons doing? So those numbers matter. How many you have and how they're doing, it does matter. Uh, but we also need to know that about half of our cells in our brain are not neurons. They're called glial cells. And glial comes from the word for glue, because when they were originally discovered, researchers thought, well, they're just there to hold things together. Turns out they have a number of important tasks. 
These are immune cells that live in the brain. These are cells that contribute to the blood brain barrier. These are cells that help our neurons have enough energy to function. And so all of these variables, so the health of the glial cells, the health, the number of the neurons contribute to how you think, how you act, how you feel. And when it comes specifically to Alzheimer's disease, one of the more consistent things that you see on brain scans and on post-mortem analysis, usually you don't take a sample of somebody's brain when they're alive. It's, it's not really considered uh, appropriate. So when you see people's brains after they die, and when you see people's brains on imaging, and when you take labs, you, you basically see that there's a shrinkage of the brain. And it's kind of a, uh, it's actually by weight, it's lighter. Uh, and you can see that in two specific areas of the brain, there are some of the most discrete changes. And those are in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. So the area right behind your forehead, that's very involved with high level thinking, weighing the pros and cons, making good decisions. And a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which you actually have two, the hippocampi, but you have one on either side of your brain. It's basically deep inside the middle of your brain. Hippocampus very involved with memory. And so in people with Alzheimer's, you see shrinkage damage to those parts of the brain. So our goal would be based on the available research to say, what can we do that might help offset or prevent that damage from happening? And then you say, well, uh, some of the drivers of this damage may be a buildup of proteins. People may have heard the name amyloid. It's a type of protein that seems to build up in the brain of people with uh, Alzheimer's, especially in those two regions I just described. But really you get to trying to understand the systems that overlay on the neurons in the brain that seem to, to impact their day-to-day -day function. And these will be systems that people will probably be familiar with because we're talking about the immune system, specifically inflammation. These are things like our hormones or our endocrine system and specifically our kind of metabolic hormones, things like insulin, as well as stress hormones like cortisol. They also involve molecules that are called neurotrophins. And I know we're going over a lot of science here, but there are certain proteins that are produced in our brains that seem to promote both the growth of new neurons and the connections between neurons. One of those called brain-derived neurotrophic factor seems to drop off in people with Alzheimer's as well as in mental health conditions like depression. Turns out there are interventions, the most powerful one being exercise, that can increase that molecule. So again, what we've said here is your brain is packed with these neurons. There's billions of them. They actually have connections between neurons and glial cells, trillions of them. You have these glial cells, which are kind of once thought of as support cells, but actually have a number of other functions within your brain, probably about 50-50 split of the cells in your brain. And all of these cells are acted upon by these systems, the immune system, the endocrine system, your metabolic health, and these neurotrophins like this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So what can we do to impact these systems to protect our brains? Well, that's where you start getting to, let's look at the research on specific diets, specific forms of exercise, uh, stress mitigation techniques, um, brain exercises, all of which may or all of which are linked to better cognitive function, potential risk or decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease, and seem to act by way of these systems. So I know I give you a big chunk here to think about. So I'm happy to go into any of those pieces that seem relevant. Yeah. And I think going into the more specifics, and by the way, that was a great uh, overview and um, going to maybe, maybe the specifics about which specific exercise interventions have been shown to be most helpful. And same thing with dietary interventions also. Great. Let's start with exercise. One of the things that I did wrong for many years in the clinic is I told people you need to exercise five days a week for 30 minutes each day. And why is that? It's because those are the recommendations. Now, for a small subset of people who are maybe close to that, it could be helpful. For the average person who maybe exercises, maybe, right, who is maybe spending the majority of their day sitting down, me telling them you got to go from zero to 150 minutes a week is like me saying you've got to go from eating junk food to three bowls of kale a day for the rest of your life. It's not going to happen and it's not helpful. So what I would start off by saying is if you're not somebody who regularly exercises, then any exercise is the best kind. 
And to that point, I think it's really important to understand that you're going to hear people talk about uh, high intensity interval training, weight training, all these other types of trainings. Now, in your case, Kevin, some of this is more relevant because you want to do weight bearing for bone health. But as it relates to brain health, what the research shows is that exercising is linked to better brain health. And yes, certain amounts, certain types, all that. But if you're not doing it at all, just finding something that you enjoy, whether it's a walk around the neighborhood, some stretching, some yoga, a bike ride, that zero to one is worth so much more than what I see so many people try to do, which is no exercise, new year comes around, I'm going to go to the gym every day, or I'm going to run a 5k every day, trying day one, day two, day three, and then quitting. And then basically spending the rest of the year, 362 days of the year doing nothing. So finding something that works for you and going from zero to one are the most important things. With that said, there's a lot of conversation around uh, kind of traditional aerobic style exercises, your jogging, things that you know get you out of breath and comparison with resistance training, weight training. Um, research now shows that both resistance training and your more conventional aerobic style exercise both increase this molecule brain-derived neurotrophic factor that's really important. That's one of the pathways that is most consistent as far as the links between brain health and exercising. In addition, exercise in general is linked to a decrease, a net decrease in inflammation provided you're not an extreme athlete. So this is where you get a little bit of a split between people who are saying, I'm not doing much, what should I do? And people who are saying, I'm an absolute optimizer and I will do the extreme end of whatever is possible. Inflammation in and of itself in a chronic form is linked to higher risk for not only just Alzheimer's disease, but worse cognition, including uh, mood issues like depression. So one of the goals in a brain healthy program is to limit the effects of chronic inflammation. Moderate exercise is linked to lowering of chronic inflammation. So that's great. High level exercise, so we're thinking extreme athletes, may actually experience the exact opposite. The reason for this is really interesting. So when a person exercises, and if you were to measure inflammatory markers in their bloodstream immediately after exercise, you would find a spike in inflammatory markers. You'd specifically see elevated levels of an inflammatory marker called interleukin-6. However, what seems to happen is what's called a hormetic response. This is the idea that small doses of stress are actually net positive for the body. So an exercise is maybe an inflammatory response acutely, but chronically actually lowers inflammation because you get more anti-inflammatory molecules that happen after you get that acute spike in inflammation. If a person is, however, running an ultra marathon, you don't get that, re that rest phase. You don't get the balancing phase. So the net effect may be higher levels of inflammation. So to try to put this into, I guess, some more concrete terms, if you don't exercise, doing anything is amazing. If you're trying to find a way to exercise that's good for brain health, look for activities that you will enjoy doing consistently. We're looking at things that you can do consistently rather than one-offs. And if you're trying to decide between aerobic and resistance training, I would say yes. Find the ones that you enjoy. There's maybe a bit more data for aerobic exercise as it relates to brain health outcomes, but I do think for a number of reasons, uh, glucose utilization, prevention of sarcopenia, immune state, that using your large muscle groups, in particular your lower muscles, so leg day uh, with weight training is an excellent way to hedge against some of the uh, physiology linked to worse brain health, as well as kind of all the diseases that we try to prevent as we age. So that's where I go with exercise. I'll pause there before I jump into nutrition. Absolutely. And, and I would say too, for bone health, the resistance training piece, so important. Uh, and I love that you touched on that too. Uh, doing leg day, the deadlifts, the squats, those kinds of things. And again, if you're at a place right now where you're not even exercising, you know, we need to find what works for you and slowly progress you up. You don't need to just start at the most, um, you know, extreme thing day one. That's not probably going to be the best thing for you anyway. So uh, let's, Dr. Austin, let's go down the the dietary intervention path for prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's as well. Great. Uh, 
As it relates to all of these systems that I described, so the immune system, the endocrine system uh, that are related to brain health, we now know that diet kind of interacts with all of them. And so at a very basic level, our bodies are made of molecules that come from our food. Uh, we're not going out into nature and pulling in molecules from the air and you know synthesizing as do maybe plants with carbon dioxide. Um, what we're doing instead is we're absorbing the amino acids, the fats, the carbohydrates in our meals, and most, more so the amino acids, but the fats as well, they become part of our actual physical infrastructure. Our brains are somewhat unique in that compared to other organs, they have a very high fat concentration. So if you were to take the water weight out of your brain, the majority of the mass would be fat. Uh, number of reasons for this, but suffice it to say that your brain is primarily made of fat after you take out the water weight. And to that end, there's a not so hard step to get over, which is to say, if I'm going to build my brain out of my dietary fats, wouldn't I want to be taking in the fats that are better for my brain and building a healthier brain rather than building my brain out of Hershey's bars? You know, it's not as direct as what I just said, but the point remains, you want to feed your brain with better fuel, right? You want to put in the, the high test for something that you're going to really want to be functioning at a high level for the rest of your life. The other pieces that are worth knowing about this, just more generally, is that we now understand there's a powerful gut-brain connection, meaning what happens in our GI tract is influencing our brain function by way of things like the vagus nerve and also by way of the microbiome which is the collection of 39,000 or so bacteria that live uh, primarily in our GI tract. And so the food that we eat impacts this gut microbiome. Uh, it influences our gut health. And both of those things are now thought to impact our brain health. So important there as well. Um, we know that the food that we eat is one of the strongest things as it relates to influencing our immune system moment to moment. So uh, there are some patterns of diet and really this will be one of the core points, the standard American diet or the Western pattern diet, which is a diet incredibly rich in highly processed food. So that's a diet that is linked to higher levels of inflammation in our bodies. It's also linked to higher levels of brain related conditions that we want to avoid. Um, so that's maybe as a starting point, why there are connections. Now, as it relates to the connection between specific foods, specific uh, dietary patterns and brain health outcomes, you're always going to see the articles about, you know, the top three superfoods for brain health. Um, I mean, I've written some of these articles. I'm very familiar with this. What I would tell people is it's not about a individual food uh, as far as this food's going to save your brain. When you think about how diet correlates with brain health, the most statistically significant results relate to people eating a pattern of diet over the course of years and their risk for developing a brain condition like Alzheimer's. So yes, you could talk about blueberries and walnuts and these other superfoods. I really think the emphasis needs to be on avoidance of the standard American diet. We can talk about some specific ways to do that. And instead eating as much as possible, a diet rich in whole foods, of which there are two diets that have been consistently shown to be the best ones as it relates to Alzheimer's risk reduction. Those two diets are the Mediterranean pattern diet and the MIND, M-I-N-D diet. There is a little bit of uh, debate over the exact specifics of what it means to eat a Mediterranean pattern diet, because it turns out the Mediterranean isn't just a little city, right? There's tons of places in the Mediterranean region. So what somebody eats on one part of the Mediterranean is different from what somebody else eats. By and large, the kind of core aspects of this is eating things that humans have not messed with that much. So it's avoidance of added sugars. That's really important. It's avoidance of foods that you have to look on the back to see what are the ingredients. That is a processed food. Now, fruits and vegetables and, you know, in the mind and the Mediterranean pattern diet, they tend to emphasize fish and poultry and uh, kind of de-emphasize red meat. I will say in trying to untangle this a little bit more, look at the process aspect of it. So if you're eating red meat, there's a huge difference between a piece of highly processed salami that comes from a feedlot cow compared to something like a wild or grass-fed animal. 
I think that's important to say, but by and large, it's a focus on whole foods. Um, in these diets, at least there is an emphasis on whole grains. We could talk about that if there's some interest in determining, well, I heard grains are bad for our brains and why would anyone want to do that? But it's going to your grocery store and shopping on the periphery is one way to look at it. It's going to your farmer's market and trying new foods that are, you know, basically the food itself. It's not a, a mix of 18 different things. It's, this is the weird vegetable. Maybe I'll try eating it. Or this is some fruit that I've never seen before. Maybe I'll try eating it. It's using spices. It's uh, tea and coffee, which are rich in polyphenols and other antioxidants linked to brain health. It's a little bit of alcohol, but I'll say my take on this would be alcohol is probably not good for people's brains. I think that if you're going to do it, make sure it's in moderation. Um, but then just to come back to maybe the easiest and most applicable of these points, if you're looking to create a diet that is good for brain health, maybe the easiest thing to do is to avoid certain highly, highly processed aspects of our modern diet. To that end, added sugar. And what I tell people is if you're going to do one thing, try to reduce your exposure to sugar sweetened beverages. The research here has been among the most consistent that people who drink more sugary beverages, so we're talking energy drinks and coffee drinks and even fruit juices have the worst outputs as it relates to overall and brain health. And I think it's one, it's an area in which most people do not understand how much sugar they're taking in, in this form. So big picture on diet. Research is pretty clear. Try to avoid the standard American, standard kind of highly processed diet. Try to eat less processed foods, whole foods. Try to eat something close to a Mediterranean or mind diet. You can look those up online on my website or otherwise if you want specifics on the foods. And try to especially reduce your dependence on sugary beverages. And that'll be, in my opinion, uh, 80 plus percent of what needs to happen as it relates to the most important steps that are based on the research correlated with better brain health. And in terms of fats, uh, are there specific fats that we can be consuming that you like maybe preferentially over others? Um, you know, coconut oil helps with the production of ketones, um, olive oil, you know, any, any of those specifically that you like? Yeah. I, again, I think you can get into a scenario where people are trying to supplement into what should just be part of a balanced diet. So the coconut oil has been a big kind of popular thing. I use coconut oil. I'm not saying that's bad. Um, as it relates to research around fats, I would say top tier for brain health is your omega-3s. And as it relates to omega-3s, you know, the the best dietary sources are as of now going to be animal based. So if you're a vegan, you should consider either getting an algae derived form, or you really need to be taking in a ton of kind of plant based like uh, black seed, chia seed, nuts, and even then you're probably not converting enough. So omega threes, and the best sources tend to be seafood. So there I would say, looking at uh, fish sources, the smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovy, sardine, herring, those are good sources. Um, you're not really going to get great numbers of omega-3s in any sort of an oil unless it's a fish oil. So I think that's that's where I'd start. The, the next tier down would be uh, kind of other forms of unsaturated fats. So mono and polyunsaturated fats. Olive oil is probably the best one as it relates to what's been studied. You know, I didn't bring this one up as it relates to the Mediterranean diet, but that is, if you're going to focus on one specific type of oil, that's usually an emphasis point. I use a ton of olive oil. I've seen pretty good research connecting olive oil with brain outputs. So real quick on that front, like everything, it's hard to get the good stuff. Olive oil, if you're going to buy it in the States, tends to be cut with vegetable oils that are exactly the opposite end of the spectrum of what you want, which is omega-6s. So if you're going to get an olive oil, try to get it from uh, a certified uh, reseller because most of the time it's going to be cut, including at the restaurant when you get it. Um, you want to make sure that you keep that somewhere dark. You want to make sure you keep it somewhere cool because those fats have a tendency to oxidize. There's some debate as to whether you should cook with olive oil. I do. I've seen some research suggesting that even if you're frying with it at more or less reasonable temperatures, it won't oxidize. But if you're not wanting to cook with it at high temperatures, that gets us to some of the other fats that might be good options. You brought up one coconut oil. 
coconut oil has a lot of saturated fat, which many people are opposed to. One general theme I would put forth is that when people want to say something is or isn't good as it relates to a macronutrient, like a fat, uh, even something like a saturated fat, like that, that's not how science works. It's not how our bodies work. There are multiple types of saturated fat. There are probably some that are worse than others. Uh, coconut oil is unique in what you said that it, uh, has a higher chance of having some of these triglycerides convert into things like ketones. So that's interesting to certain people. Um, we do use some coconut oil here. It has a, a higher cooking point. So it's nice for those higher temperatures. Also avocado oil is a good option there. And one of the things that we use is, is ghee and, and butter. I mean, there you'll have some people debate the relative merit of the cholesterol, the saturated fat, but specifically ghee, I find I don't have any issues with as far as my lactose tolerance tastes good and um, something that's been used for a long time. So I would say in order of kind of operations with fat, it's getting your omega-3s for cooking oils and for food prep oils. Uh, olive oil is awesome to put on top of stuff without cooking with it. Some people debate the relative merits of cooking with olive oil. I think at lower temperatures, it's not really an issue. And then I go avocado oil, coconut oil, and ghee as kind of my next go-to is based on partially just taste. You know, they have different flavor profiles. I use all of those. Each of yeah, those. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, use each of those. So that was great. And thank you so much for uh, for a thorough walkthrough there. And now you mentioned, um, as you were talking, you mentioned the immune system in the brain. How does the immune system in your brain shape your thoughts, your health, your happiness? This is something that if it's the first time people are hearing uh, this now, you're going to hear it again because it comes back to a point I made before, which is we have this weird idea that there's how you feel, which is somehow separate from what's happening in your brain uh, and that there's nothing you can do to influence it other than acting on your psychology. So we're all thrilled to read an article on psychological websites or in a journal talking about, well, just think a different way, change your thoughts, um, listen to these affirmations. And what we're doing in all of these cases is actually working on our brain cells. And that's the only scenario in which you can change how you feel is changing your brain, right? And as it relates to the things that we now know, change our brains, the immune system is top of the list. So let's go back to one of the statistics I pulled out before. You have your brain's filled with billions of cells, of which about 50% are neurons and 50% are these glial cells. About 10% of your cells in your brain are what are called microglial cells. It's a subtype of glial cell. And what makes that so interesting is that these are basically immune cells. So the idea that you have an immune system in your body, but your brain is somehow separate from immunity, it's completely uh, fabricated based on the available research. Your brain has this 3D network of these microglial cells with these, these cool kind of arms that reach out. And, and what they're doing is constantly sampling and looking for data. And that data can be inflammation. So if, for example, you have a leaky blood-brain barrier and new inflammation from a bacterial infection from your gut gets into your brain. These microglial cells reach out with their arms. They taste this inflammation. They taste these pieces of bacteria and they say, this is a problem. We need to deal with this. So what they do is they physically and functionally change how they work. They change shape, they change what they produce, and they amplify whatever data they receive from the outside world. So to give you this in, in a, a very specific example, let's say a person has leaky gut, or let's just say they're getting a lot of kind of pieces of bacteria coming into their bloodstream from their gut, which may be a lot of people. Um, that inflammation in the form of this bacterial piece that comes in through the gut and gets into the bloodstream, if these microglial cells sample it, and you can see this in a cell culture, they get all basically inflamed. They change their shape, they get really upset, and they start producing a whole lot of inflammation themselves. The reason would be to tell the brain, like, we need to take care of this, to bring in more cells, to basically wall off that inflammation. But if you're in a joint and you're, and I mean, I mean this as far as in the body, like not some sort of a random bar, if you're in a joint and you find yourself, uh, 
developing inflammation. So let's say you had an infection in the joint, your joint gets swollen, it gets painful, it gets stiff, and you can point to it and say, well, obviously something's going on there, that's inflammation, and you'll lose function of that joint, right? You won't be able to walk on it as easily if it's your knee or if it's your elbow, you might not be able to extend your arm as easily. When that inflammation happens in the brain, it's much harder to understand what that loss of function is, right? Because you're not walking with your head. It's not like you can immediately sense that pain. You may not even get a headache. Instead, what we now understand is that the inflammatory state of the brain, which is really a reflection of these microglial cells, correlates with things like depression and Alzheimer's disease, and even moment to moment decision making. So how you feel right now, Kevin, if you're feeling happy or sad, is in part a reflection of your brain's immune state. And the best example I can give for people to understand exactly how powerful this is, is to think back the last time you were sick. So you might have got a viral infection, you might have contracted a cold, you might have had uh, some other sickness. And think about how you were thinking. Think about how you were feeling. How was your energy level? Were you excited about the day? Were you uh, optimistic, interested to call up your friends and have a long conversation? Were you thinking clearly that you thought, you know, today's a good day to get my taxes ready? Chances are, unless you're a, a huge anomaly, you didn't want to do any of those things. You weren't feeling good at all. Uh, this has been described as sickness behavior. There's a term for it, which is when we get sick, we think and feel a different way. We actually feel a little bit more depressed. We feel a little bit more socially withdrawn. And the dominant hypothesis for why this is happening is inflammation in the brain. So if you start extracting from this and you start understanding that how you think, how you act, how you feel, isn't just some esoteric psychological construct, which is outside the bounds of biology, but is rather a direct manifestation of what is happening in your brain each day, and especially what's happening in your brain's immune system each day. And there are things we can do to act on this. Now, all of a sudden, you have some of these tools to act on the, the physical architecture of who you are, how you think and how you feel. And so that alone, I thought, was really an incredible breakthrough in my understanding. When you layer in the additional piece of saying, how is the modern world impacting our brains, impacting our brain's immune system? Uh, spoiler alert, it's not good. Then you start to appreciate, you know, maybe some of these reasons why, despite having access to all of this amazing technology and all of these things that are supposed to make us happy, we have a scenario right now where so many people are experiencing mood issues, high levels of stress. Uh, th there's correlations there between our environment and our brain's immune system. You don't just wake up with depression. These are things that just like Alzheimer's develop over time. And we're starting to untangle what that actual biology looks like. So it's the understanding of what's going on. And maybe more importantly, the understanding that there are things we can do to directly act on that machinery so we don't find ourselves at the mercy of a society that would just as well wait until things got so bad that the only option was a pharmaceutical. This is fascinating. Um, you know, and one of the other areas that I think is important that I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about is how, what is the connection between the quality of their sleep and their brain health? That's a, it's another one, right? We think, well, what is it that, well, let me just ask you, Kevin. So if you're thinking about, I had a good or a bad night of sleep, what are some of the variables that you would think this may or may not have contributed to it? I mean, the first thing I think about is tracking. I mean, uh -huh. I use the Aura Ring to track that, but the the timing, the temperature, um, you know, consumption of food uh, leading up to um, all those kinds of things, I think, play in the light exposures, all of those things. Sure. And potentially, depending on the age of your children behind you now, that could be a variable too. <laughs> but uh, but you're right. So so you obviously have some good insight into these are the things that you can do or be exposed to in a given day that directly relate to your quality of sleep. But if you ask yourself, who who is the person, if there was a person in your body who was picking up all these little data points and spitting out, here's your sleep quality tonight, who is that? And it, it's basically a little person in your brain, right? So your brain is the driver of sleep. Sleep doesn't 
uh, originate in your foot and then extend up through the rest of your body, there are brain waves that you can clearly see. And if you do a sleep study, they put electrodes on your brain to see what their brain waves are doing, right? So this is this is in essence where sleep comes from is the state of the brain. So with that said, there's some really fascinating research that was done almost a century ago, I guess at this point, but where they started to ask this question of what is it that makes us sleepy, right? So is there something you could measure in the bloodstream that makes us sleepy? Where if a person has high levels of this molecule, they are sleepy. And if it's low, they're feeling really awake. And so they, they tested all these molecules and they were looking at animals and they're saying, is there something that we can say, if this goes up, people get, or animals get sleepy. They looked at all sorts of random animals, but they found one molecule that correlated with in dogs, they were sleepy or they weren't sleepy. And then they analyzed it and it turns out it's an immune system marker. It's kind of a pro-inflammatory marker, which led to the surprising understanding that inflammation is actually a necessary component to kicking off sleepiness, that it is actually key to that process. Now, I'm not saying this is something where, you know, you want high levels of inflammation, but from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, I think we're still at a place where people don't know why we sleep, which is a crazy thing that people spend a third of their lives doing this thing. And we're still saying, well, you know, it's good for the brain. It's good for the body. Some things happen. You clean out some waste. No one knows what is happening. So if you want to go conspiracy theory, this is an interesting place to go. Why do you shut down for eight hours a night? Nobody knows, right? But I will say that if you want to layer in some evolutionary mechanism here, it does seem like a lot of repair processes happen while we sleep at night. And it does seem like there's a reason why when we're sick, we're more tired, we're more sleepy. It's telling our bodies, you need that rest. And so it it would make sense that if levels of inflammation were higher, we might feel sleepier, more fatigued. And so that could be one of the reasons why these inflammatory proteins seem to influence our level of sleepiness and sleep. So that's one component of this. But as it relates to sleep and the brain in general, what we know is that our sleep quality predicts our mental health, predicts our focus, our attention, our long-term brain health. So getting poor sleep now predicts a higher risk for developing Alzheimer's later. Similarly, people with Alzheimer's have a hard time getting good sleep. Uh, it's the same kind of thing as it relates to mental health disorders. So getting good sleep now predicts our risk for developing a ton of brain conditions. Could it be in part that those brain conditions are already setting up in our physiology and that's why we're not getting good sleep? It could be, but I would say I think many people will have had the experience where they were doing fine. They were having a normal day. Something bad happened, something stressful. Uh, or they had to stay up late to study or whatever else. They got poor sleep and they could immediately see the next day that their brain function had dropped off. So from a kind of causal linear perspective, if you do an all-nighter and then the next day you need to be highly focused and have good attention it's pretty clear that it's not going to happen for you. Like if you had to do a long road trip and drive for 12 hours, but you skip sleep the night before, your ability to stay focused, keep your attention on the road the next day is not going to be good. So there is a, a very direct correlation between your quality of sleep and your ability to think clearly the next day. Some fascinating research shows that our quality of sleep actually influences things like our emotional state. So our ability to have more emotional reserve to handle the highs and lows of the next day is dependent in part on the quality of the sleep that we get, especially the REM sleep, which tends to be the second half of the night. But to consolidate this into something that's actionable for people, if there's anything that you want to do that relates to better brain function, probably the single most important thing that you can do to make that happen in a short amount of time is to prioritize your sleep quality tonight. Straightforward is that. There is literally nothing else that an average person can do that will so quickly and demonstrably translate into better brain health than getting better sleep tonight. And the way you do that is exactly the things, Kevin, that you've already outlined. It's paying attention to your light exposure, to your temperature, to the stress you consume right before bed. It's not being on your phone and watching TV immediately before you get into bed. It's, it's in essence protecting your nightly sleep as one of the most important things that you would do 
for your overall and your brain health and making that your routine every day where just like paying attention to your food or getting to the gym, you say, it is one of my top priorities to be in bed at this hour and give myself an uh, eight hour window for high quality sleep. If my goal is to be a healthy person, if my goal is to have good brain function. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. If you're finding it helpful, please leave a positive rating and review. Hit that like button, subscribe to the podcast or the channel. That lets us help more people and reach and serve more people. And it also lets us know that this is helpful to you on your journey to better health and stronger bones. And then also, right down in the show notes, you can actually find a link to my free bone healthy recipes guide that's going to give you access to some amazing and delicious recipes to support your journey to stronger bones and then also we have a link to my free stronger bones masterclass in the show notes too and that is the three-step process that has helped people in over 1500 cities around the world get confident in their plan for stronger bones over 110,000 people have have taken part in this and it's been really really helpful for them and i want you to have free access to it too so add your name and email right down there in the show notes get access to that free stronger bones masterclass and let's get you confident in your stronger bones plan today that's great. And I know we're coming close to our time here uh, together. And this has been absolutely amazing. Maybe if if we are able to do it in just a short period of time, I do want to share where people can find you. But also, uh, from a sleep perspective, I do know that um, obstructive sleep apnea can be an issue for people. But what about central sleep apnea? We don't hear about this a lot. But obviously, that's occurring because the brain's not sending the proper signal. So could maybe you just touch on that too? What's What's going on there? Yeah, well, so just bigger picture wise, I think what you brought up is a really important point, which is like many things, people feel like either it's not a big deal, so I'm just not going to worry about it, or they'll hear something, read a blog and say, oh, take some valerian root and sleep issues are done, right? Or take a melatonin and it'll solve your problems. One of the things that we've seen uh, clinically in the research, and I'm sure many people will know this from their own families, is that sleep disorders are very, very common. And the most common of those would be the obstructive subtype of sleep apnea, but there's restless legs, there's central sleep apnea, there's, there are a number of sleep disorders. And the important point to understand there is, while there's a ton that a person can do on their own to improve their sleep quality, in order to properly diagnose and manage these types of conditions, you really do benefit from a sleep study done with a qualified health professional it isn't something that you can manage on your own. So sure, a person with sleep apnea could lose weight and improve their sleep apnea, but going to your professional, meaning your health practitioner, if you can't sleep well, and especially if you have some of these symptoms, so you're sleepy every day, you're told you're, you snore, you wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air, your partner tells you that you do that type of thing, um, you find yourself drowsy despite seemingly getting a good night's sleep. Uh, you're overweight, you have a large neck, you have high blood pressure. These are all indicators specifically for a sleep disorder and more so for sleep apnea, although there's some overlap with restless leg syndrome. What I would highly recommend is that people listening start to pay attention to the basics of better sleep hygiene. And there's a number of ways to do that. Um, you know, you can Google these. I have them on my website. You can basically start paying attention to the light exposure, the temperature, the, the timing of the day you get in bed and all these other things. There's a whole lot of meat there. But if you're really having trouble with sleep and if you're feeling incredibly fatigued during the day, and if you're doing that despite trying some of these conservative uh, aspects, I would highly recommend going in to get a sleep study. I, I don't think for the purposes of the average listener, central sleep apnea is actually as big of a deal as is the obstructive subtype. I do think it is the advice I would give is if you're having a lot of trouble sleeping, you know, it might be a psychological thing, in which case you still benefit from seeing a health practitioner. It might be a physical thing like obstructive sleep apnea, where you'd still benefit from seeing a qualified practitioner. Get help on this. It is just like any other aspect of your health. You wouldn't try to manage crazy blood pressure on your own, or maybe you would, I don't recommend it. Um, these aren't the instances in which you are going to take a supplement and everything's going to resolve. That might help, 
but you're not addressing the root cause of the issue, which can often be better interpreted through a little bit more advanced testing. This has been great. And I would love for you to share um, where people can find you and find your work. Uh, and we will link to those resources in the show notes as well. Great. Uh, main place that people can find my content is austinperlmutter.com, which is my website and Dr. Austin Perlmutter, which is my social media, at least for Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I have a newsletter that I try to put out a lot of free content on. Um, those are probably the best places to find me. I mean, I, I have a number of different roles and one of them is with this company, Big Bold Health. So if you're interested in the immunity stuff and the research we're doing there, bigboldhealth.com, but those are probably the best places. Awesome. Well, I'm going to link to both of those resources in the show notes. Dr. Austin Perlmutter, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you so much for your time. And for everybody listening, you can find all the resources, show notes, everything mentioned here today over at bonecoach.com forward slash Dr. Austin Perlmutter Brain Health. I want to thank you again. We'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. It's going to tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.